uh, I just use this these quick pictures here to uh, to to illustrate um, that the thing we all share in life um, and how subjective experience truly is. And um, um, Joel uh, has used a term like the dream state sometimes, where you know it's indescribable how it's indescribable some of the experiences we have using virtual reality or even in real life and how to translate them to somebody else. And we know that when there's someone there with us, um, we, we've created a bond through experience um, that um, it really never existed <clears throat> before. And um, uh, there's, no, there's really no other uh, substitution for that. And so part of the criteria that we tried to meet with, um, with the concept of, uh, of, of our larger next stage uh, of the facility um, was to be able to open up uh, and democratize the technologies of uh, the head mounted displays, how to get a little bit past that. We started learning about um, different uh, centers of excellence in the world that were using uh, tremendous scale displays uh, to allow one or more people uh, to uh, experience 3D media um, driven through game engines in real time, um, uh, like Joel mentioned down in the US. And um, it's a bit of a, from an AV perspective, it's a, it's a bit of a chicken before the egg situation because you can do as many stakeholder consultations with as many, um, with as many disciplines as, as, as you can. And um, you'll never, the person can describe what they're trying, what they want to achieve um, but you'll end up with a laundry list of completely different um, uh, solutions, technically. So the challenge was to find a, a technical solution that could accommodate almost any dream that any new media artist has uh, to, to build and display uh, on, on the, in our facility. Uh, I just wanted to make another note as well that in the Commons building at the Okanagan, uh, during the time of its construction, this was uh, this is simply an idea on paper. The, the stakeholding process, stakeholder process consultation was happening during the building uh, being planned, and that um, uh, when the construction was completed, we just had an empty room and a blank canvas. And so at that time uh, is when we went down to the states to see some facilities that were in production, and we and we uh, hired a company called Mechdyne Corporation um, that specialized in immense displays especially uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality. Um, and uh, we'll get to hear from them a little bit later. But we toured uh, some of the facilities down uh, in the States with one of their fellas, and um, he helped contextualize the trip for us. So very quickly, some of the more traditional um, experiences that we know that uh, rely on uh, heavy duty AV infrastructure are projection mapping, as you've seen those fine art applications uh, around the world in public spaces where thousands of people are experiencing rich and lush motion and light and color and sound at the same time. We, we've had ultra large scale 70 millimeter and larger uh, movie theaters uh, projection systems uh, over the past 30 years. There's an increasing use of uh, VR enabled theme parks where there's a mix of physical and virtual stimulus um, there and online gaming, I think, could be argued that is, is a is a shared experience as well. And I think uh, um, you know, with network speeds and, and the, the innovations with hardware and head-mounted devices, we're going to be seeing a more seamless experience, uh, shared experience there as well. So I've mentioned the the consultation with MechDyne and the discovery trip with five universities that Joel mentioned, and I'm just going to walk you through some of the some of the setups we saw down there and. Uh, this is in the Hunt Library. It's not so much of the public facing one of the component spaces they have. They probably have about 10 different audiovisual systems for use uh, uh, by faculty and researchers at Hunt. Some are front, uh, public facing in the library and some are a little bit behind closed doors. You can imagine the levels of support across um, across uh, the support staff and the technical proficiency required and the mix of skills that are required to support these kind of places. You can see, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here. I'll try to turn this on. Oh boy, I, can, I hope you see it. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of junk in the ceiling. 
And we realized pretty quickly that this format wasn't gonna fit the bill for what we were looking for in our particular room. Big projectors, lots of fan noise, um, not necessarily the most seamless or impressive really wraparound kind of technology, but uh, is very flexible. Um, many uh, many imp input formats, the ability to, to input many different sources at once. So you could, uh, you know, you could uh, uh, send different sources to the different screens in the areas. And while we were there talking to the folks who run these facilities, we were just trying to draw out of them as much information uh, as we could in these battle stories and truly really try to understand the level of support that's really going to be required. So you saw in the, in the previous picture some projection, some direct projection display stuff that we're all familiar with. Uh, and, and then we visited uh, the next site where we saw, uh, again, not, not an entirely glamorous facility. This is actually a dedicated research facility that's built in an, in an office space. You can see the drop ceiling, uh, et cetera. But you'll also notice the people uh, who are into VR, uh, the light boxes on top of the truss work and this curved faceted wall, much like our Sawchuck Family Theater, nearly the same size as well, but it's got this curve. And what the curve gives you is kind of a sweet spot for viewing where you, you, you do feel a sense of immersion. Um, and you can't see anything except the screen when you're standing in a certain position. And when the light's coming, when the light's being projected towards you, instead of from behind you, um, and because these are direct view displays, there tends to be just a vibrancy and a contrast uh, that's available that we just did not see in the projected system. So at this point already, because of some of the physical things we didn't like about the projection, we started leaning towards the faceted displays like these things. Got two pictures here just to show you the kind of junk that's uh, you're gonna find behind the gear. This is like, you know, the stuff you'll see at stagings for concerts and this kind of stuff. And uh, on the right, you'll see a, a whole rack full of uh, pretty high tech equipment. There's fans just huffing away, hot air blowing out, noise. Uh, it's in the space actually shared here uh, with the wall. So it seems like a big science experiment, honestly, when you're in there and um, didn't really have that environment that we were, um, we were dreaming of for our own uh, visualization and emerging media studio. This is um, Rowan University uh, in uh, New Jersey. And these are projection displays as well, but you'll notice there aren't any projectors in the ceiling here. This is all rear projection display. And uh, it looks pretty good. Um, it looks pretty good. Uh, the, some of the problems here are, um, once again, um, the vibrancy and contrast that we can't reach with projectors that you can with these direct view displays. This one goes all the way to the floor and it's uh, pr pretty high as, wall, uh, as well. The design the, that uh, they, they, they kind of put a catchphrase on these types of walls, they kind of call them caves. In fact, they, they can be found out there in the world, especially in the UK and the US. Um, they're, they're nearly 360 degrees wraparound and they just have a single panel um, where you walk in and out of the, of the cave. They're completely immersive. And all those were, although though they were very intriguing, um, that design, we just didn't feel it was broad enough to, to uh, be able to accommodate every application and desire that we could offer or that we could uh, you know, host for, for faculty and researchers across every discipline. Because that's a very high arching goal of ours as well is to be able to uh, accommodate nearly any idea uh, that somebody wants to try. A couple more slides there. And yeah, you'll notice in a few of these slides that Joel showed as well, it looks really blurry. And that's because we're, we are wearing 3D glasses in many of them. And um, this is, a, this is a modeling of um, uh, oceanographic events and flooding events. So, you know, this is, a, this is an example of, of a data set that's been visualized over uh, mapping information. And we're, we're, we're seeing this in more and more in, in, uh, in data visualization and scientific simulation is uh, drawing on real-time um, data that's out there in the world being drawn from sensors integrated into uh, uh, other base layers of data. 
And uh, it's some pretty heady stuff. And uh, it's really where a lot of innovation is going in the world of information. This is a little exhibit that was uh, created by this, the fellow driving it right here. It's more aimed at the public engagement. And that too is an avenue um, that VEMS is, is uh, looking to support. It's one of the goals of the, the, the library of the 21st century movement is, is a higher level of community engagement uh, to get uh, people in the community to be able to benefit from the investments in the library. So this one here is more meant for the kiddies. And it's, it's, you can control with a, with a hand controller where you place the bones on the dinosaur and, and build a skeleton back together. Another, uh, another map one. And I just wanted to show that for the scale. And, you know, this was impressive. It's a little more, it's a little more high tech. We got, everything's blacked out, you know, we got the blacked out uh, ceiling and the rest of that. And, and we were getting to a place where we, we were getting pretty intrigued. This was like the size of a small aircraft hangar. And, and we don't have that kind of space in VEM. So once again, um, we had to kind of diverge from this design. This is what it looks like behind the scenes. Not entirely glamorous. Um, we 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 want to provide um, the kind of experience that you'd find almost in a classroom. In fact, our interface for for our studio is going to be a single touch panel, uh, much like a, a, a teaching theater um, where you press a couple of buttons and everything turns on. Uh, it's going to be centrally supported by our AV team and our IT uh, department. And so that uh, basically, if there's any uh, problem, it's essentially supported service. And it's not a uh, kind of a mad scientist researcher who is the only person who knows how, how this stuff runs. You can see the space required behind a rear projection system and the amount of projectors. I think this is up to 10 or 11 or 12 projectors. Uh, I'm gonna to touch quickly on uh, how we drive this many sources um, traditionally and uh, why we're, working on a continuum of innovation, and you, you really can't just go to the store and buy one of these, is because uh, in the days that everything we've seen here was developed and deployed, they were, they were based on uh, high performance computing clusters that were actually multiple computers that um, were synced together uh, down to the millisecond. And it was tremendously expensive and it had a tremendously high technical overhead to maintain them. Um, and, and keep them tuned and calibrated. Um, but in the modern era with uh, NVIDIA's GPU technologies, um, we can fit as much uh, processing into a single uh, rack space server box uh, that they could 10 years ago uh, with uh, multiple towers of, of racks filled with computers. And so um, our driver for, for, for our wall is going to be in a single rack space in one of those equipment racks that I showed you. Um, this is a projected cave. Joel uh, sent, uh, showed a, a picture just a short while ago of this one. This is a heavy duty 3D uh, molecular simulation. Joel's wearing a head tracking rig and he is inside that uh, molecule right now. You can't tell on this 2D picture, but the immersion um, is shockingly real. Uh, this, this particular model was not built for show. It is literally technically uh, was living research and uh, was foundational in, in, in some discoveries about these types of polymers uh, and their structures. And so uh, when you get two or three mad scientists in a room together, interacting with something like this together, you really get some sparks flying. That's what it looks like uh, with the projectors off. It's hard to believe that when uh, in this older style of, of cave style of visualization, um, that once you turn those projectors on, the seams and the angles kind of disappear. And um, you start to realize how much reality, how much your brain really dictates um, how you're interpreting your environment. And it's not uncommon in situational simulation, such as firefighting simulation or law enforcement um, to really see some increased heart rates, perspiration, and uh, things of that nature, because it is fooling your brain into thinking that you're somewhere that you're not. And uh, it's actually shocking how fast the grids that Jason mentioned on the wall, how fast those fall away, then you become blind to those limitations and you, you, you start to uh, experience. Again, some of that 
room back there and equipment. And we just don't have that kind of space uh, at uh, in the Venn studio in the Commons building to be able to work with. So then further winnowed down our choices for technology and our selection. Big old projector. And some more gear. So these are some of the criteria. These are just only a few of the of the activities that we wanted to be able to facilitate in our studio. And I can tell you that I, across my travels and through my relationships I've built across Canada and the US, um, this is the probably the most ambitious menu of uh, activities that we've come across so far. And I think that um, um, it's going to be enabled because of the state of technology right now and the affordability of, uh, of the screens and the, and, the, and the computing performance, as well as the game engines uh, usability and um, uh, that's coming, uh, it's just rapidly advancing so quickly. So digital exhibits from around the world, from leading institutions, the Smithsonian, uh, British uh, Museum of History, we're seeing uh, libraries and museums create ultra high resolution digital exhibits um, and, Frankly, there is no place to play them. We are building things like this for future generations to enjoy, but UBC Okanagan is going to be able to natively host uh, digital exhibits from around the world very soon. Scientific simulation, this is computationally driven imagery and visualization that uh, you're, you're trying to, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an old, uh, it's an older concept, but you're limited by uh, computing power and we have one hot rod of a machine in this that's going into this room. It's going to be able to do real-time uh, modeling of uh, ISO surfaces, which are things like air, aircraft wings and uh, ship propellers and things that have a tremendous amount of dynamic uh, forces and be able to visualize that in real time. Uh, we're putting together, putting next generation uh, video conferencing collaboration tools in there to try to meet um, the, the try to meet the uh, environments of modern day and advanced manufacturing processes where you've got decentralized models of ultra high resolution um, AR overlays over a manufacturing and uh, production teams and manufacturing teams located in different places around the world. Um, your, your standard hardcore goals um, of uh, experiential teaching and learning. So the very nature of this, this studio um, is experiential. Um, and so we, we hope it's another uh, arrow in the quiver uh, for faculty that, 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 uh, that can take advantage and have that kind of vision to use a facility like this. Um, one of the other basic scenarios is a decision-making theater, which they call, um, and that's being able to host in a, in a time of crisis for the leadership of UBC to uh, gather in the room and um, uh, look at real-time data of, of emergency uh, emergency signage systems and um, um, essentially emergency preparedness, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in times of uh, in times of uh, crises, as well as future planning for our university in line with the 2040 research goals here at UBC Okanagan. Uh, we're working with a lot of architectural plans and visions, and uh, a display of this scale allows. Uh, 10 to 15 people to experience architectural walkthroughs at a one-to-one -one scale of viewing. And I see a question come in from an attendee. Do you see this technology being used in visualization, visualizing architectural design precisely? And the magic there is the one-to-one -one scale. So instead of a couple of people huddled around a desk, uh, it'll feel like you're standing in a room uh, and one person can essentially fly you through the entire building yeah, in almost one-to-one -one scale, which is just... It's, it's breathtaking. So at the end of the day, this is what we came back with. 40 screens, 40 screens, just over 10 feet high and uh, about 30 feet wide uh, with 82 million pixels, nearly 83 million pixels. Um, the, a, a big demarcation here that makes our wall unique is that um, we are not scaling the audio, uh, the video signal to the wall. And we see scaling, uh, high quality scaling technologies nearly across the board. The capabilities of the compute that we've spec'd for this wall uh, are gonna run every display at its native resolution. So the techies out there who understand uh, that native resolution means that you can walk up to this wall and it's going to be as clear 
as your as your uh, as your screen on your Mac computer. And so with uh, with no apparatus on your face, uh, you'll be able to uh, have a really near field experience uh, that's larger than almost uh, anything you've ever seen before. And so that is really uh, this the progress update on this is that it's being assembled right now down in the US and we're looking for delivery uh, towards uh, the end of January. This is a kind of just a 3D model of the room to give you an idea of the capacity. Uh, before the wall goes in, uh, we, had, we had up to 40 people in, in, in the space. Um, of course, COVID really complicates things. In fact, it has clouded our vision so much because it's hard not to, uh, you know, we're coming out of the end of it and we can look forward to some normality in the, the next summer here when we're fully up to speed with our programming. But uh, yeah, it was it was hard getting to this point and then realizing that no one can stand in the room together. Um, it was heartbreaking, um, but uh, we're all confident we're going to come through the other side and we're going to build something great. And I just wanted to put a shed a little bit of light on the operations and the vision behind um, these two um, these two these two zones in the Commons, the the VEMS. Uh, what we call VEMS, the Visualization and Emerging Media Studio, which I just showed you the wall, and the Sawchuck Family Theater, and and uh, what Dr. Dulick mentioned about Joel's uh, unwavering support. Um, you know, there's a there's a layer in, in institutional uh, technology support that's um, it's become increasingly obvious that we need expertise to to uh, support faculty and researchers uh, like never before. Uh, because of the demand for access to technologies like this. So um, with the recent restructuring of, of UBC IT Okanagan, we've got dedicated resources um, uh, in place to, to not only uh, launch this program, but to try, try to slowly grow with it and to apply resources as needed. And that goes kind of across the library. You can imagine the conversations uh, when you're dealing with a place like the Smithsonian, trying to understand how to translate digital exhibits of which there are no standards for production right now to be able to take the data shape it for our individual wall and then find a way to uh to uh essentially host it on display and uh we're really looking forward to to um, working on our workflows and the programming with the library staff uh, in full partnership with ubc studios uh, UBC IT Okanagan and the Emerging Media Lab Okanagan. Um, and uh, that's uh, almost near the end of my talk. I, uh, I'm looking forward to some questions, hopefully. I see another one come through for virtual presentations. Did you visit the void in Pleasant Grove, Utah? It is now the 20th time I had to rejoin this webinar. Sorry to hear that, Kyle. Um, it's a busy time of day, 417. A lot of people getting home from work, they tend to saturate a Wi Fi networks at home. But no, we did not. But thank you very much for bringing that up. We're going to take note of that. And uh, right now, we are, uh, we are aggressively contacting any center of digital imaging excellence uh, that we discover and, and try to uh, establish relationships with uh, the, the forerunners out there uh, anywhere in the world that they might be located. I'll just wait for uh, any other questions to pop in here. Garth, there's a question uh, that uh, Jason had, wasn't able to type it into the, I need my mouse back, Garth. Oh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Is that the uh, last slide there, Joel? I think it is. Let's eh? take a quick look. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, so Jason was wondering, uh, in the case of the back projected screen example, what about the projector lights? Do you remember what the material was in order to diffuse the projector light? When I have a back projected on Lycra, the projector's light was so overwhelming to the actual projected images. Mm, so sounds like we might be talking about hot spots. Um, and yeah, it's a um, there. There are very specialized materials used for rear projection. Not terribly expensive, but you can see the architectural design that is required to to make the frames to get the exact tension, the exact placement of those projectors, um, so you so you don't have those hotspot conditions. And if anybody's wondering, 
that's why you don't see an actual purely curved wall. Uh, because of the way that light works and the way that the photons travel, uh, the, the, set, the part nearest you is going to be receiving the most energy uh, compared to the parts that are a little further away. So the only way you can really get equal brightness is have a uh, have a, like that flat surface. And that's why you see that slight graduation in the facet, faceted uh, the faceted walls, but it's a tough, uh, I, I'm assuming maybe that you've tried to make a home rig in the past, uh, Jason, and um, it's possible. It's possible with some work and depending on the kind of projector that you're using. Yeah, and some are worse than others, I, I think. Excuse me. But, uh, you know, I'll speak just a little bit more about the audio, maybe in the SFT thing too. Uh, part of the support vision there um, for these special places is um, a real, formal iterative loop of, of um, consultation with users and uh, applying uh, changes literally throughout the academic year. For instance, you know, Joel and I have a list as long as our arm of technical improvements that we are going to apply to the SFT directly from the feedback from the work that uh, he uh, did with the class uh, through development and, and playback of their of their pieces there. So we learn how to do our jobs better by working more closely with faculty and researchers. And that is the language we speak. And that is the, uh, those are the goals we're trying to meet. Um, it's not, uh, we're not, it's not, uh, in fact, it's, it's a new age as far as um, of advanced support for emerging technologies uh, uh, historically, in, in some of the, uh, the, the bigger libraries in the world, uh, you just didn't have such sophisticated systems that needed ongoing maintenance. And also that inter interpretation, when someone comes into a space and says, here's what I want to do. And for someone to have the, the, the technical wherewithal and the artistic uh, or the creative uh, sensibilities as well to collaborate um, with, with a client to meet them in the middle, to be able to translate the technical shortcomings or the technical potentials of the venue and then help them, help them reach their goals. And so that's what we're trying to build as well in, into our consultative process. And there's no questions at the moment, but, um, but Alex did comment that, uh, regarding presentation spaces for media work, that there are so few public opportunities to show immersive media locally. The large display spaces at UBCO are really, really critical for our students to be able to build and practice for such displays. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that for a second? Sure thing. We've, um, we know that uh, the University of Calgary has recently built a, a wall. University of Alberta has built um, a smaller wall. Uh, the University of Toronto uh, put in a wall last year. I was at Concordia University in Montreal. They too have installed a wall. So we don't want to get caught behind uh, here and we want to offer our students world-class experience on some uh, on world-class equipment. And we're well on our way uh, to doing that. And uh, we just can't wait for um, uh, uh, new groups and new, new semesters of, of users and students to come through the spaces, use the gear, and you know have those ideas lead to the next and to the next, and uh, really build up that community of uh, high power media artists, emerging media artists. And we have uh, one more question that's come in. What is your strategy for input to the setup? Do you think using six DOF controllers or the like has value? Absolutely, absolutely. We haven't, um, we're trying to build such an open philosophy to the system that uh, human computer interaction is actually a very high priority for us. Um, I know that um, as, as uh, Dr. Dulick mentioned, um, initially uh, a software set, the Max MSP uh, was uh, uh, anteed about talking about making a computational media uh, uh, production kit um, that's actually very unique to the faculty of creative uh, critical uh, studies here at UBCO, and it was their ambition to actually really start doing human computer interface in this space, the SFT, which she alluded to. Now that's kind of public facing and, and we can do that. We're, we're open to it for sure. Um, in fact, it's one of the most intriguing areas of in 
truly interactive computational based media. It's super exciting. In the studio though, in the VEM studio, we've got a raised ceiling um, which has a complete studio grid. So very, very quickly we can, it's all full power and data as well in the ceiling. So we're gonna be open for people plugging all kinds of devices in. We've got music uh, inputs for musical instruments. We've got uh, multiple HDMI inputs at 4K resolution. We've got wireless inputs. Um, we've got on top of the truss, we've got all sorts of potential for motion tracking systems uh, temporarily or um, permanently installed. In fact, we're, we're, we're at the stage now of maturity where uh, Joel and I are act actively contributing to grant applications uh, because the granting agencies, uh, they, they, they favor collaboration with other units at institutions. They know the value that it can present and the interdisciplinary potential. And so we're actively uh, contributing to grant applications and I can foresee in the future of layering other technologies into the space that we just couldn't afford to do now. And that's one of our other uh, ongoing goals. Um, so definitely um, every kind of sensor and every kind of controller uh, we, we would like, we're looking forward to try to integrate them and, and play with in the space. And including spatialized audio, true spatialized audio. Um, we think it's going to become very important. So we've got a we've got a um, a relatively basic ability to to create a directional audio um, when we when we open the studio. It's 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 designed that way. But we'd like to emulate uh, Concordia University's example of a true uh, audio dome. Um, that, that will surround the users. And we're talking 20 to 40 or more speakers that are completely in, uh, assignable and imageable for uh, beyond rich stereo sound. So uh, for talking about immersion, um, yeah, uh, anything and everything, just send us an email. <laughs>